The opening prayer is adapted from the Gospel of Thomas. Glory to you, merciful and tranquil. Glory to you, Glory to your compassion that was born unto us. Glory to your greatness that was made small for us. You are the hidden light of understanding, pointing to the way of truth. Amen. And let's sing the music for preparation, NCH 85. I woke up this morning and you can sing whatever you want. You can sing State on Jesus, you can sing State on Freedom, whatever is within you right now. <laughs> As a little introduction to this morning's reading, it's the Easter season, it's springtime. The last couple of weeks we've explored the extremes of biblical accounts, I would say. Mark's Gospel, the earliest version, which ended with that stark empty tomb. And then last week it was John's Gospel, the fourth Gospel, with many post-resurrection experiences. And so today what I want to do is explore one of the Gospel of John's rivals, the Gospel of Thomas, an account that was excluded from the Bible and that was discovered in 1945 in the Nag Hammadi Library. How many of you just curious, familiar with that? Just raise your hands. Okay, all right. The Gospel of Thomas offers us a strikingly different Jesus from the version that many of us were taught in Sunday school. And it lends itself, this, this gospel, I believe, lends itself to opening ourselves to the myriad diversity of people's responses to the question that Jesus asked, who do you say that I am? It's a question I believe we're still asking now. And the questions are, are part of faith-seeking understanding. So, so here's a reading from the Gospel of Thomas. Jesus said, If those who lead you say to you, See, the kingdom of heaven is in the sky, then the birds will precede you. If they say to you, It's in the sea, then the fish will precede you. Rather, I tell you, the kingdom is inside of you 
and it is outside of you. When you come to know yourselves, then you will become known and you will realize that it is you who are the sons and daughters of the living God, our father and our mother. But if you will not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty and it is you who are that poverty. So ends our reading. Let us meditate on these thought-provoking words in the sanctuary of our hearts and minds. Please pray with me. Come, Holy Spirit, fill our hearts and kindle us in the fire of your love. Send forth your spirit that we may all be renewed and together through you, we shall renew the face of the earth. Before I begin, I wanna um, extend a special welcome again to all of you who are here for the first time. I wanna welcome Maya back. Thanks so much for singing this morning. And I also want to welcome anybody else who's here that wants to say hi. And I also see on Zoom we've got um, some new folks included and some old folks, um, including Miralee King, wherever she is this morning, wherever in the world. So welcome, everyone. So I wanted to begin. One of the, one of the premises of the Gospel of Thomas, and we've heard a bit about Thomas in the canon, where Thomas really needs direct experience. Let me see and touch. Unless I experience, I will not believe. How many of you relate to that? It's like the world of science, like show me the data, evidence-based, consider the source. So, so this primacy of our own experience versus handed down, and then how do we reconcile the two? Because we're living in this, this both and. We have these stories that have been passed down, and then we also have our experience. So I'm gonna take a risk this morning and share with you a story that I had back to direct experience. When I was seven years old, I was raised Catholic, so I had all these questions about the resurrection. What really happened? What does it mean? Um, I've told some of you this story. Some of you haven't, okay, so I'm seven years old. It's right around Easter season and I'm wrestling with what does this mean? And so the dream was, I really wanted to know what was going on that Easter Sunday morning. And so I walked by myself to the tomb and there was a stone pushed in front of the tomb. And so I used all my strength and I pulled the stone and I looked inside. Some of you are gonna get scared. And there was Jesus and he was looking at me and he was really angry. And his eyes looked like this German shepherd dog that had bit me. And I was terrified and I screamed. And then I realized I better not scream because my parents will be terrified by this dream. And so I kept it to myself. And in my prayer life, what I eventually came to understand was that that wasn't Jesus. That was the institutional church saying, how dare you ask this question, you seven-year-old. And I think, wow, what a courageous little kid. I was. And there's something about our questions as part of our faith that is so important. And so I think it's so important to listen to ourselves and listen to children. That's why I think Jesus said, let the children come to me because there's some honesty in there. And so I wanna tell you the story of the discovery of this gospel, of these Gnostic gospels, and see if it speaks to you. So here we go, our story today begins in Egypt, in a time and place far removed from today's political and social upheavals. It begins with a tale that I think is worthy of the Arabian Nights. December 1945, Egyptian fellaheen rode their camels out to the Jalal ad tarif a huge cliff near the Nile River, honeycombed with caves. They came in search of tabak, which is a natural fertilizer 
that they used to nourish their crops. Hobbling their camels at the foot of the cliff, the men began to dig in the soft soil around this massive boulder resting on the face of the cliff. And then they struck something hard and they swiftly uncovered a red earthenware jar that was nearly a meter high. They were terrified. They thought that that jar might contain an angry jinn or spirit. And so they hesitated. But soon the legends of treasure buried on the edge of the cliff and the caves overcame their fear and their curiosity overcame their fear. Muhammad Ali al-Saman raised his pickaxe and smashed the jar with a single blow. Golden dust, he swore afterwards. Golden dust flew out of that jar and vanished into the air. The men searched the shards of pottery, but they found no gold, only some old books bound in cracked leather. Disappointed, Muhammad Ali carried the books in the loose paper home and dumped them on the floor near the oven. And for several nights, his mother fed the fire with sheets from that papyrus. The remaining texts, after this torturous journey through the underground economy, were eventually identified by scholars as Christian gospels missing for nearly 2,000 years. These manuscripts, called the Nag Hammati Library after the nearest town, opened this new window into the teachings of Jesus of Nazareth and the myriad movements that he inspired. And I believe that he continues to inspire now. And so the, the big question was, after Jesus was crucified, his followers struggled to make sense of the sudden end of their leader's life and ministry. Some had insisted that he hadn't died at all, but had been resurrected and raised into heaven. And so as many of us have talked about, as the church grew more formally organized and the authority of the priests and the bishops expanded and eventually Constantine declared himself in the third century AD, the head of the church over the bishops, the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed, any of you familiar with that? Yeah, an orthodox belief system evolved that declared Jesus as the divine son of God who died for our sins the Messiah of Hebrew prophecy, a miracle worker raised from the dead who preached an impending apocalypse. Determined that the church, the church institution speak with one voice, its leaders denounced alternative views as heresy. Heretics were persecuted and excommunicated and many were killed. You know that old saying, history is written by the victors. <laughs> the orthodox version of the Jesus story became the New Testament. The heretical version was buried, some of it under the great cliff at Nag Hammadi. The books Muhammad Ali al-Saman uncovered turned out to be the scriptures of the early Christians who called themselves Gnostics, from the Greek gnosis, which means knowledge or knowing, implying direct knowledge of God. As Elaine Pagels has pointed out, Elaine Pagels is a um, former professor of um, theology at Princeton University. She points out a more accurate modern translation might be insight because gnosis demanded profound inner reflection to know oneself, the Gnostics taught, was to know God. Or as Shakespeare put it, to thine own self be true. Where Orthodox Christians held that God is transcendent and alien, Gnostics asserted that the self and God truly understood are one and the same. For Gnostics, Pagel explains, exploring the psyche became for many explicitly, which is now for many people today implicit, a religious quest. 
And of all these Gnostic scriptures, the one that's most intriguing and accessible is the Gospel according to Thomas. Transcribed in Coptic, a late form of Egyptian, the original was probably written in Greek, but some scholars believe it may have been written in Aramaic, which was Jesus' original language. Although it was likely compiled in the second century, Professor Helmut Koster of Harvard University Divinity School suggests that the sayings may predate the Gospels of the New Testament and thus bring us closer to the actual times of Jesus. The Gospel of Thomas offers us a Jesus that is strikingly different from the icon many of us were taught in Sunday school. This Jesus worked no miracles, except the miracle of getting people to be compassionate and share and heal one another, proclaims no apocalypse, and dies to redeem no one's sins, but dies out of self-loving to stay the course. This Jesus insists that his own divinity is no different from yours or mine. Rather than a messiah or a demagogue, he is a teacher of wisdom, a guide to divine understanding. His gift to us is not a catechism of belief, but in Pagel's words, a method of attaining oneness with God. The secret revealed by the Gospel of Thomas is that we've been looking for God in the wrong places. God's kingdom, it proclaims, is not somewhere up in the sky, nor in some future time, but here and now, in every human heart. Or as some of, if you really think deeply about all of the parables about the kingdom of God and the kingdom of heaven, it's here at hand and it's not here yet. It's both and, it's time outside of time, it's everywhere and it's in us. In the gospel, Jesus preaches, if your leaders say to you, look, the kingdom is in heaven, then the birds of heaven will precede you. The kingdom of God, the gospel of Thomas says, is already spread out upon the earth it's inside of you and it's outside of you, but people do not see it. We must seek God within ourselves, he insists. When you know yourself, then you will be known and you will understand that you are children, sons and daughters of the living God. But if you do not know yourselves, you dwell in poverty and you are that poverty. Thomas's God is a God of light the divine light shines forth from within each one of us. This Jesus teaches, if they say to you, where have you come from? Say to them, we have come from the light, from the place where the light came into being. If they say to you, is it you? Say, we are its children and we are chosen from the living God. Another Nag Hammadi text, the dialogue of the savior, the disciple Matthew, demands to see that place of light, which is pure light. Jesus answers, everyone who has known himself has seen it. But if each of us has this divine light within us, why do we need a savior? According to the Gnostic Jesus, we don't. In the Gospel of John in the New Testament, Jesus declares, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. In the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas, Jesus uses that same image, but turns it upside down on its head. He says, there is light within a person of light, he says simply, and it shines upon the whole world. This Jesus is not a savior, but a teacher. In his humility, Jesus disclaims even the role of teacher. Parallel accounts of the canonical Gospel of Matthew and the Gnostic Gospel of Thomas provide this dramatic contrast. In this famous passage from Matthew, Jesus asks his disciples, who do you say that I am? When Simon Peter answers, you are the Messiah, son of the living God, Jesus replies, I'm paraphrasing, you demand. <laughs> <laughs> or 
or the equivalent in Aramaic. And I tell you, Peter, he exclaims, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail over it. But in the Gospel of Thomas, the story unfolds very differently. Jesus asks his followers, compare me to something and tell me what I'm like. One says, just a messenger, and another, a wise philosopher, still another, a teacher, to which Jesus replies, I am not your teacher. Because you have drunk, you have become intoxicated from the bubbling spring that I have tended. All of us, he suggests, partake of the same divine waters. All we have to do is drink. Rather than pointing his disciples toward some coming apocalypse, the Gnostic Jesus constantly brings them back to the present moment here and now. I'm looking at Paula thinking, be still and know that I am God, the present moment here and now. When they want you to know how the end will come, Jesus answers, have you discovered the beginning? Then, so that you are seeking the end, for where the beginning is, so will the end be. It's kind of like a Zen koan to think about it. The ending and the beginning are one. Endings are beginnings, as T.S. Eliot put it. When they say, tell us who you are, so we may believe in you, Jesus replies, you examine the face of heaven and earth, but you have not come to know the one who is in your presence, and you do not know how to examine this moment. Know what is in front of your face, and what is hidden from you will be disclosed to you. This Jesus speaks with the poetic beauty and brevity of Zen koans. They are incisive and bracing. If you bring forth what is within you, Jesus says in the Gospel of Thomas, what you have will save you. If you do not have that within you, what you do not have within you will kill you. If his disciples are asked for evidence of the divine and the human, Jesus advises them to answer, it is motion and rest. Split a piece of wood, Jesus says, I am there. Lift up a stone and you will find me there. Do these sound vaguely familiar? I'm thinking of um, Jim back there, movie buff. The 1999 Hollywood movie, Stigmata, um, it was a screenplay that used the Gospel of Thomas as a model for the suppressed manuscript that caused so much trouble for Patricia Arquette and Gabrielle Byrne, not to mention the Catholic Church. To Thomas's Jesus, the kingdom of God is a metaphor for absolute non-duality. When you make the two into one, when you make the inner like the outer and the outer like the inner, the upper like the lower, when you make male and female into a single one so that the male will not be male and the female will not be female, then you will enter the kingdom. Another Gnostic text, the Acts of John, embrace a single aphorism, the four noble truths of Buddhism put forth. Learn how to suffer and you shall be able not to suffer. Acceptance of life is suffering. And once we accept it, it becomes easier. Life includes suffering, but it also includes joy, and there is both in the present moment. Similarities between Gnosticism and Hindu and Buddhist teachings have led some scholars to speculate that the Gnostics, or Jesus himself, were influenced by Indian and Asian travelers to Palestine. Stories persist that Jesus journeyed eastward during the undisclosed, unchronicled years of his youth and early adulthood, and that some of his disciples trod the same path after his crucifixion. I 
I just want to do a little check. How many of you are fascinated? How many of you are saddened? How many of you are just, wow, it's, no wonder it was suppressed. <laughs> Whatever their influences, the Gnostic Gospels were an anathema to Orthodox Christianity. The church hierarchy felt understandably threatened by a movement that championed direct experience of the divine rather than priestly mediation that taught salvation through self-knowledge rather than Christ's crucifixion. And so the church fathers denounced the Gospel of Thomas and other Gnostic texts as heresy. One theory holds that the monks of St. Patrimonius, a monastery within sight of Jamal a Tarif, kept these writings in their library. In the year 367 AD, Athanasius, the most powerful bishop of Alexandria, Egypt, ordered a purge of books with heretical tendencies. One of the monks, fearing the destruction of these precious teachings, sealed the manuscripts in a jar and stole away to bury them beneath the great cliff where they rested undisturbed for 1,600 years. So here we are as members and friends within a non-doctrinal denomination, the United Church of Christ. And so within this context, we are free to understand Jesus in many ways, according to the scriptural texts, scholarly interpretation, historical evidence, the Holy Spirit, our own inner life, or any authority we choose, or any combination of those. We're free to worship Jesus as divine, as uniquely divine, or as one of the enlightened of many or few, like a bodhisattva, admire him as a teacher, a healer, a prophet. And so we continue then and now to be in conversation, not only with that question, who do you say that I am, but in conversation with the empire that would like to tell us one version that supports the empire in what they want us to think he is. The manuscripts unearthed in 1945 by Muhammad al-Saman added startling and intriguing details to a portrait of a very different Jesus. He found no gold in that shattered jar, but what he found continues to challenge and inspire us to rejoice in this present moment and to discover the divine within us, within all of us, and in all things. Amen. And if you want to talk about it more, I'd love to read Elaine Pagels with you and set up some other conversations. Amen. And we will now hear the response hymn. Okay. So, <laughs> very spontaneously and generously, Maya's going to teach us a song. <laughs> Hi. Um, this song uh, was written by Jody Simone Lester, who was a high school friend of mine in 1983. And um, I co-wrote a play called Changing the Silence with six other high school students in a time where we were very frightened about the threat of nuclear war and were organizing with a group called Students Teacher Organization to Prevent Nuclear War. And so this song was the um, incantation at the end of that play that we sang as we were looking. And it's very connected with a Gnostic <laughs> interpretation of the Bible of really f um, feeling ourselves connected to spirit and everything and in a, and of uh, this is very appropriate for your speech actually so it's just three lines and it says i may be peace wider than water deeper than fire and it goes um we'll sing it um how many times should we sing it i think we'll just because they start i think we'll just sing it and go and try to do it 
Okay, there we go. So it goes, I may be peace, wider than water, deeper than fire. I may be peace, wider than water. Deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water, deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water. Deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water, deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water. Deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water, deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water. Deeper than fire, I may be peace. Wider than water, deeper than fire, deeper than fire. Resonance in that, thank you. Thank you. Mm. So from that place of peace, we now come to the time where we bring to mind our prayers for the world, for our country, for our city, for ourselves, for our loved ones. And so I'm going to turn it to you this morning. Um, I want to lift up your prayers and Nancy Taylor has the mic so and also those of you who are on zoom we want to hear your prayers too so please type them in the chat and I'll lift them up well I'll begin you know one of the things I didn't include in this um, sermon was I was thinking about um, this reliance on our own internal experience and the dynamics of power that have been used to um, suppress um, people of color, LGBTQ people, um, people of different religions, um, poor people. It's like your feelings, your ideas, your beliefs don't matter. And so there's some power in um, empowerment in this this um, return to the legitimacy of our own feelings, our own needs. I think about that seven-year-old, Lori, the, the legitimacy of those questions. So I, I pray for the empowerment and for our capacity to listen to those we might disagree with, those we might perceive as different from or we might be afraid of or threatened by, to just hear the reality of the, the experience of one another. Are there other prayers? May Day prayers. Think about May Day. Yeah. Are there any May Day issues? Yeah, of prayers? Um, yeah. You're talking about empowerment, and May Day is the power of, of um, labor unions. Yes. And, and that that's, there's a resurgence there, and I'm, I'm grateful. That yes, people, you know, yes. are organizing like yeah. at Amazon yeah. and Starbucks and 
yes other places so prayers that they that that, that power yeah comes forth most of the world celebrates international workers day today and the u.s kind of shifted it back to september 1st because it was also the pullman labor riots and violence it was a yeah so anyway there yeah it's a it's a really interesting history yeah jim i pray that on may 9th vladimir putin will have nothing to celebrate he'll still say that they'll celebrate something but i pray that there's nothing really to celebrate and I pray for so many of the, I pray not only for the Ukrainians, especially in Maripol, oh my gosh, but I pray for so many of the, the Russian people and the soldiers who are victims of all this propaganda. And I also pray for this country because, you know, I think about all the misinformation back in Vietnam, you know, about how it was going and our own history of, of war. Um, I pray for all of us. I pray especially for the victims of every war. Are there others? Thank you, thank you, thanks. Um, other prayers. I think about May Day for our planet and I'll get into that with announcements, but let's turn it now to um, our own, um, there's people in the congregation I know who are, it's like our own hurts and our vulnerabilities and our needs, our prayers for our loved ones and for ourselves. And our prayers, that are too deep for words, our prayers within our own selves. And also, um, if uh, people on Zoom would like to um, add their notes to the chat. Well, then I'll pr everybody's quiet, I'll pray, I'll pray for us. I think about um, the ongoing effects of COVID um, and the social isolation that we're all continuing to feel and that we find creative ways to continue to connect more deeply with one another because we need it. Our prayers continue for Paula and Dave Byrons, um, that Dave um, continues with his, with his healing and um, that this family is surrounded with love and support. Um, David Guerra and Claude and Al, that this family is also surrounded with love and support. I'm looking online and I see there's like um, merrily thinking about um, people who are involved in counseling and healing, the kind of demands that are on, especially people who are counseling soldiers, um, the, the kind of trauma that they go through. So healing in that work. And I see Catherine Rangi's on, and so I think about the work of physicians, especially during COVID, that, um, that they are supported in staying safe and staying strong. 
And there's Kathy Phillips, I think, of affordable housing, the work that she does um, in Concord, and that um, how, how much harder it is, how many people are commuting longer and longer distances because of the cost of living, and that um, we find ways to um, make it easier for more people to be able to afford and get a living wage. Other prayers? <laughs> I'm just going on. <laughs> for each one of us. All right, then, let's join together in the prayer that Jesus taught us. About gratitudes. Oh, gratitudes, right. I'm grateful for Maya's music the last couple of Sundays with us. Thank you. And your prayers. I have the um, gratitude. Yeah, go ahead, Nancy. For um, um, the people at Skyline that are really involved in postcarding and changing, uh, making changes, positive changes in our country. Mm -hmm. um, I see Philippia here, and Paula's done postcarding, mm -hmm. Sheila, mm -hmm. and Becky, and Jim, and Catherine Kessler, and um, Car um, Carolyn Katanzana, yeah. and oh, I'm probably not B, um, I'm not, yes. and, and Lori, yeah. Yeah. Um, I'm not, Carolyn, Carolyn Noble. <laughs> Anyhow, I have more it's postcards a, it's today, a gratitude. too. <laughs> yes, because it's like, I, I, we keep thinking about, you know, the Georgia elections, yep. and how 11,700 votes, and lots of small faith communities like ours, making sure that people who are at risk of getting off the rolls, I'm convinced that that made a difference. Yeah, and Maureen, I have postcards for Georgia today too. Excellent, excellent. Thank you, Nancy. Let's join together in the prayer that, oh, I have another gratitude. So um, some of you might remember Horig and Derek um, and Sammy and their baby Mika. I um, was so, I, joyous to um, preside at a baptism tomorrow, yesterday, and um, it was so wonderful to, um, to celebrate Mika and to be with this family. This place, what they were saying was, oh my gosh, we got married here, and then six years ago, Sammy was baptized, you know, and now it's Mika, and it's like it takes them back into, it's like time outside of time, they're remembering their wedding, they're remembering the baptism, so this, um, this special place and these, um, the depth of the prayers that um, Hurig and her sister and her brother-in-law shared as godparents was just so moving. So it's a joy to be a part of that. Um, all right, then let's join together in that prayer that Jesus taught us about how we're all children of God and therefore sons and daughters, sisters and brothers of God. Our creator, mother, father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and forever. Amen. And let us prepare our hearts and minds for communion. And today I want to begin by going back to the, the wisdom of the Gospel of Thomas that speaks about communion within our true self, our deepest self, and God. That place where every now and then there's this voice within us that tells us what we need. When we're very quiet and when we're very open and when we listen and the word itself, communion, co and union. And let us just hold the silence. 
for a minute. So I will invite Sheila to come forward and pass the communion. You can stay where you are this morning. It'll be simpler. And, um, and then Gabrielle will be playing the communion song. Yes, which if you want to sing it is um, NCH 337. And we'll sing verses 1 and 3. And then I'll ask you to hold off until after we sing together and then we can partake together. spirit of communion with God, with our ancestors, with future generations, with our truest, deepest selves, and with one another, let us take and eat and drink.
precious Lord, lead us home to this place of peace that is here and now in this moment where all is well and all shall be well and all matter of thing shall be well. As the great mystic Julian of Norwich said, Amen. And so we'll now receive this morning's offering. And we're also passing out lights um, for later on in the service after the announcements. Okay. Sure. Well, I'm really honored to be here. And um, the Easter story has been something that has been sending a lot of healing and opening in my family. Mm. So I want to really thank this congregation. And as, as I said, one of my beloved ancestors, Michelle Bullard, the first time I came was her memorial service. So there was a real um, feeling of transcendence and rebirth here for me in that time. And, and Michelle uh, did acupuncture with me during my daughter's birth. And we had a home birth that could have been very dangerous, but we all came out fine. So I, I hold her very deeply as someone who holds the space for tran transformation and rebirth, and that she was honored here. Mm. So the song that I'm going to sing is called Mist Upon the Mountains, and it was also written by Jody Simone Lester, who was a beloved teenage organizer, activist, friend. Um, and I think the words really speak for themselves, um, but it felt very connected to me, both to May Day and to the international workers moment of rising up together, and also to the um, pre-Christian origins of, of Beltane, of really being a time of renewal and rising up in spring and just the bursting forth of the earth and humans as a part of, of nature, really. So I love this song and I, um, it was recorded actually on my mom's album um, in 1984. So I brought a copy of that for, for oh, the two of you Thank to be able you. to listen to. And um, I was just getting out of high school when we, when we recorded it. Wow. Um, so I usually sing harmony, um, and so this is sort of a new thing for me to sing solo in the melody, but may we all come into our voices in the time we need to. And like a mist upon the mountains, people we are rising, and there's no hope stronger than the breeze upon the sea. There is strength in the hearts of those who are wounded. We will keep on rising until we are free. There is hope in the morning the memory of the twilight, there is hope in the rolling song of dawn. There are those who dance not, those who are not free. And we must dance twice as long, twice as hard, twice as deep until we all dance free and like a mist upon the mountains people we are rising and there's no hope stronger than the breeze upon the sea. There is strength in the hearts of those who are wounded. 
And we will keep on rising until we are free. Mmm. Mmm. Thank you. Oof. Wow. We give thanks for the gift, so many gifts, these, the gift of the music today, the gift of one another, and the gift of the life of this community. And so I have um, a number of announcements, and some of you might have announcements as well. Um, so I wanna, on behalf of the church council, I wanna thank so many of you. I've talked with so many colleagues in faith communities, and this has been an extraordinarily challenging time. And um, I'm really inspired by what we've been able to do together. Um, and so I, I thank you for your ongoing support in so many ways, because without it, our ministries would not be possible. Thank you. Um, so a couple of different things. Um, Next Saturday, the 7th, um, if you would like to attend an event to support the interfaith movement for human integrity, and our former music director, Benjamin Mertz, is playing there. Um, it's food, fellowship, and music. Contact Nancy Taylor. Um, and this is a movement, for those of you who aren't familiar, it's to um, provide support and advocacy and assistance, and in some cases, housing for undocumented people that are, especially people seeking asylum in this country. Um, again, in this season of like May Day for the Earth, I wanna, I wanna lift up thanks for the solar on our roof. Um, and Catherine, I know, is online today. Catherine and Michael, thank you so much. Um, I still have dreams of being able to do plug-ins at all of our events so that we spread the, the, the power of solar. Um, there's also a number, if you looked in the um, newsletter um, the last couple of weeks, um, there are actions that we can take, and I have some handouts in the back of the room around climate justice, because the big pressure is the venture capital um, firms like BlackRock, um, and then there's also banks like Citibank and Chase, so it's a chance to write a letter as an advocate. I don't want to assume that Skyline, maybe this is something we can vote on, but as individuals, you can, you can um, make a difference and advocate for divestment, given the state of the climate. Are there other announcements? Yeah, Carl. I brought some tomato plants. Oh. Oh my God. Uh oh, are there enough? <laughs> Thanks, Carl. Thank you. Um, so, with fellowship today, we could hang out in the friendship room, or if we have the energy to put up those tents, we can do that too. And there's some, there's some food. So, um, all right. And then next weekend is, um, it's a different version of Mother's Day, we're going to talk about, um, because it's, it, can be, it can mean so many different things to so many of us, the, um, the theme of the kind of love that supports and believes and challenges each one of us, which isn't unique to biological mothers, it's, it's in every one of us, so we're going to lift that theme up, and then the choir will be back. Okay, so our closing hymn. Okay, so we're gonna sing This Little Light of Mine and back to the very beginning of the service. I'm going to light a candle. And I want us to stand up in a Yeah. 
and we're gonna we're gonna sing the slow the slow version because I like it. So. And those of you who are on Zoom with us today, you can imagine you're holding a candle, or if you have one nearby, please light it. As we go forth from this place, mindful of the preciousness of this moment, this time, this place, and one another, and life itself, let us shine. Let us shine love. Let us shine courage. Let us shine advocacy for justice. Let us shine honesty. Let us shine life itself. Amen. Okay, bye everybody. Mwah. Have a great week.